Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast, episode number 439, Troubleshooting Testosterone Pellets for Women. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Maupin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about hormone replacement therapy for women, which is available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. So we're talking today about issues concerning women. Dr. Maupin's office also treats men, but she's focusing on this conversation about pellet issues that in particular arise with women because she's preparing for a talk that she's gonna to give to a national convention of doctors in Miami in April. They have asked her to come and speak to them about how do you troubleshoot once you have determined that somebody is a, an appropriate candidate for testosterone replacement and you use pellets as your delivery method and you put them in, do you ever have concerns that you need to address or alleviate? And in particular, uh, because she's done over 100,000 patient contact hours in the last 17 years, 80% of which have been with women, they ask her to address the issues that arise with women. So that's what we're gonna do in today's HealthCast is visit some of those concepts. So, so there's, a, there's a saying in medicine that if you practice medicine, no matter how good you are, you'll have complications or you will have problems that patients bring up and, and want answers to. Okay. So I don't want you to think that testosterone in pellet form is more fraught with danger or problems than right. any other form of testosterone. It is not. It actually has few, fewer side effects, but there are some because that's just, that's just basically the nature of medicine. People are different, they're all individuals, and they change over time. So sometimes your metabolism will change in a way or something else will happen to you that we have to, we have to then address in association with your testosterone pellets. Okay. So part of what all this would involve then is the education and training of your staff to be prepared to handle any of these kind of concerns, mm -hmm. but also the education and training of your patients to say, mm -hmm. sometimes you have to make choices. If mm -hmm. these benefits can come to you with testosterone pellets at the cost of this mm -hmm. side effect, are you okay with that? Well, that's our last method. That's the last this choice. Our first choice is try this. This usually works for most people. And since we've seen so many patients and had these issues, we know what works in most people, but there's always that outlier of somebody who is different metabolically or so, her so lifestyle. So let's, let's start with one that I think is very rare, at least in, in my mm -hmm. hearing from being mm -hmm. around you. Uh, sometimes women who get testosterone pellets have their voice become a little bit deeper. Right. than it historically has been. Mm -hmm. And is that one of those you know, worst case situations if that's just the trade-off? Are there things that you can do to moderate that impact? First of all, it's saying first that it's all, rare. First of all, it's rare. Second of all, it is um, voice changes come from other things like reflux, like like acid reflux coming oh, from your stomach. Oh, because you burn your vocal cords? It actually goes all the way to your vocal cords, when, yeah. especially when you lie down. So... We have patients in the age group of, <clears throat> as we're talking about voice, in the age group of people who do have reflux. Right. And women so have like more. If I'm laying in bed and I'm sleeping and all of a sudden I have vomit in my mouth, mm -hmm. that's acid reflux. That's well, that's, that's really bad acid reflux. Sometimes all you do is cough. Okay. You get a dry cough from the acid reflux. It's, <clears throat> you know, that kind of cough. It doesn't mm -hmm. produce anything. It's not, you're not sick. It's not a side effect from medicine. That's right. It's not a side effect from medicine. It is something that you actually have to um, think about when you're coughing. Because sometimes you just you just get used to it and cough. Right. So this is one of those things that we have to rule out. We have to rule out other causes of having voice changes. So rule out is one of your best responses to issues. Yeah. I mean, that's a... There's it's not part a of the lot triage of, process yes, of medicine. You have to make sure it's not something else besides what you're doing. Right. So it's much more common to have 
reflux than it is to have voice changes with testosterone. So we send people to either the GI doctor or the ENT to look at, the, to look at their uh, vocal cords and see if they, they're inflamed. If they're inflamed, that's not testosterone. Mm-hmm. Oftentimes, they see, if it is testosterone, they'll see a thickening. But this is something that is, it is very rare. Most patients don't use their voice to sing or to speak, so they don't find this to be an issue, even if they did have a slight change in their, in their um, range. But those that do, we try to be helpful with, and we give them lower doses. It's dose-dependent. We give them lower doses of testosterone. We then also increase their estrogen level because the vocal cords are, are actually res- respond to both testosterone and estrogen right. in opposite ways. So if you wanted to give them the same amount of testosterone but just increase their estrogen, could that be? You can, a- you can do that. You so you, you that. basically look at the person, <clears throat> their lifestyle, their concern, the degree of concern, mm-hmm. like if, I, if they were a professional announcer and were known for their voice, mm-hmm. that might, or a singer, that mm-hmm. might be more serious than, say, a housewife who says, I, I think I'm sounding a little deeper. Well, in general, I know those people. They tell, they tell me what their profession is or what their avocations are. I have that in, in their record. If they don't tell me, I don't know that. But if they do, I try to go with, I start with a lower normal dose of testosterone and a slightly higher estrogen level. Mm-hmm. I also encourage them, the women, to take spironolactone. Spironolactone is a uh, off-label, it's a diuretic, but that's not why we're using it. We're using it to, to basically go to the vocal cords and block the effect of testosterone or DHT, one of the metabolites of mm-hmm. testosterone. So that's one of the good ways to treat it. And, and generally, if we can prevent it, that's better than getting a problem. So in this way, we prevent most things if we know your voice is that critical to have it on the exact same range or pitch. So if we don't know, that's another issue. Then we have to play catch up. And then we often, if they need to have a a solution immediately and we find out it's not reflux, then we use finasteride. It's another medication, but it actually is stronger than spironolactone. Instead of spironolactone? We can use it with. With. They work differently. So we can we can pile them on to get the voice to come back, and generally it does, even though the ENT doctors say, oh, this is permanent. It's not. So it it really is not. Yeah. So it, it the voice comes back. It's just a matter of patience and using these medications, and oftentimes that speeds it up. Okay. So this is how we take care of vo- the voice changes. We prevent it if we know, and we treat it if we find out that it's actually from testosterone or DHT, the metabolite of testosterone. So over the years that I've worked with you and and known you, I've I've come to know some of your patients, Mm -hmm. but I've also run into people or had people approach me when we were out at different conferences or Mm -hmm. conventions or what have you and ask about the issue of concern in their practices. Is it an issue of concern in your practice? For women in particular, what if they lose hair or gain hair in places that they don't want it. So mm-hmm. hair adjustments, one That's way or the other. That's pretty much our biggest our biggest issue. Gaining hair is our biggest issue. So I'm okay. going to start with like that. Like a bearded lady? No, we don't no. get that. If you take shots, you can get that. But with testosterone the pellets, shots. yeah, testosterone shots that aren't bioidentical and they and they tend to give you more DHT and more of a real like beard. DHT we don't, is we don't dihydrotestosterone. See dihydrotestosterone, and that's what causes both hair loss on your head if you if you are genetically prone to that and sometimes so facial you, hair. So you put pellets in me and they're pure testosterone. Mm-hmm. Then my body converts part of that to DHT? Yeah, DHT is not all bad. DHT gives you your sex drive and makes your muscles bigger. So I want some of that. You want some of it, but you don't want to have too much. Okay, because the then I is, might grow facial hair. Well, yeah, or, we're not talking about you, though. We're well, talking no, no, about I, like I, me. Yeah, <laughs> you know, so I, yeah. so basically it's a, it's a balancing game. You want to be able to have the benefits of DHT going to your brain and, and giving you muscles, but you don't want to have too much and causing you to have facial hair or acne. Well, and I don't mean to be disrespectful, but I, but I have a curiosity. Are we talking about facial hair like a beard line? No. Are we talking about just a random no. hair we're, we're or we're talking two? about... Most of the time, it's peach fuzz. Okay. But women don't like to have peach fuzz. Even if you can barely see it, right. they don't want to have peach fuzz. Right. 
but it's dependent on your own genetics. Like I was a very hairy Italian girl. I mean, mm. that's when before I had pellets, when I had I've my actually own known a couple of those. testosterone. Yeah. I had I mean, I always, you know, the the um big fat Greek wedding. Yeah. You know, they all had the, the movie. They all yeah. had the mustache. That was they were dying their facial hair so it would be blonde and no one would see it. Right. So I remember years of doing that. Mm. And I mean that's just that was just part of my inheritance and I sucked it up and did it. Or I had it waxed off or I waxed it myself or there are all kinds of ways to remove facial hair. You can right. use an epilator which is like using 10 tweezers at a time and mm. it looks like it looks like a razor don't use a razor but it looks like a razor but it's plucking your hair why, out why not use a razor because then you'll get stubble so okay. you kiss your husband you've got guy stubble mm. it makes it it makes the hair coarser and it makes the hair darker okay and, and, and that's, that's the thing not, women know but men may not and, and yeah. that's true but not all women know that and i've heard, right. i have some people that tend to want to do that and if right. it doesn't bother their spouse it doesn't really matter yeah. but if it does but it would bother most so or it would just bother me if i had stubble on my face yeah so <clears throat> so basically worked the hair's not that terrible but and it usually occurs to people who had it before it's okay. usually not a problem because of their genetics because of their genetics because they're sensitive to dht right and they have lots of receptors in their hair follicles on their face so, so that's, spironolactone. Spironolactone is one of the treatments. Just and, like with the voice. Right. It's the same, It's kind of the same treatment as the voice because it's the same uh, byproduct of testosterone that's causing the problem. Okay. So it's sometimes we lower dose rarely. For this, we usually just use spironolactone. That usually works for this. Okay. Some women have to use a tiny dose of finasteride, but most don't. Okay. And then they use waxing periodically or uh, tweezing a few hairs out periodically that they don't want to look at. Mm -hmm. But in, a, in any case, we manage that really well. And if patients will listen to us and do what we ask them to do at the first visit and take their spironolactone, we probably wouldn't have any issues like that. But, there are, but we get acne as well. The same people that get facial hair usually get acne, although I never had acne and didn't get it with testosterone either. Okay. Um, acne has, has a, a genetic component. People who had acne when they were younger get acne again, usually when their t testosterone or DHT goes back up. More estrogen. And you tell them ahead of time this is a yeah. possibility. Yeah. If they had it in the past, then they may very likely have it again mm -hmm. with testosterone. We try to increase the estrogen dose to, to make the, the right ratio balance between the two. higher so that estrogen decreases the acne. So we try to do that, but sometimes we end up with acne and we have to lower the lower the dose of testosterone. Okay. And that's that's doable. Solves the problem. But we never know who's gonna be that person right. until it happens. So it may take two or three cycles to get to the right place where she's yeah. going to be happy. It has, it, yeah, some patients. But it gets, we know what to do to make it better and better and better and better right. in case it doesn't work on the first round, but it usually okay. does. So with, with hair, and it may not be the same issue, uh, mm -hmm. but I, I saw an, old, an older lady in the grocery store the other day who was almost bald. I mean, she just had some wisps of hair mm -hmm. and the rest of it was gone. Is if she got testosterone, would that help replace her hair? Uh, if she got testosterone and estrogen and thyroid, that's probably a combination. Okay. Somebody who has that, it can it can be hormonal or it can be autoimmune. In other words, your body, her body could be attacking the hair follicles and killing them. So I don't know. She had what I would say, being a non-doctor, mm -hmm. classic symptoms. She had a dowager hump on the back of her neck. She was overweight, plump. So probably she she probably either make and no hair. So she, so high cortisol makes your hair thin out all over your head. Low thyroid thin out all over your head and break off. So you'll see like broken hair and brittle. You have that in some eating disorders. Yes. Yeah. Yes, because that's poor nutrition. Yeah. Really bad poor nutrition. Okay. Where you don't have enough protein to make hair um, or enough vitamins. So. Um, so I had, okay, so I was, nah. <laughs> so when you have hair loss. I love when you do this, just checklist, checklist, yeah. checklist. When category. hair loss is right here, uh -huh. just right there. And you've seen people like that on elevators or wherever you're going and where you're in a space where you have to look at them and you don't want to stare. <laughs> like, What's that on your head? 
Well, or why why yeah. isn't there why anything is like else that? on yeah. your hair right. on, on your head? And in general, if you lose hair in the front, that's a lack of estrogen, and that happens and it gets worse over time with menopause if you don't replace estrogen. So here is lack of estrogen. All over is too much cortisol, not enough thyroid, which I see not enough thyroid a lot more than anything else. And then low testosterone or high testosterone or DHT from testosterone would be having these these areas thin out and this area on top thin out, but not all over. So with thyroid, general medicine seems to be in favor of Synthroid as opposed to Armour Thyroid. Mm -hmm. And we've actually had conversations about patients that, whose insurance companies have said, well, you can't have Armour Thyroid, you have to take Synthroid or we won't pay for it. Uh, what, what's the difference between the two? Why would that matter? Because I know that sometimes that's an issue when you try it to prescribe is. for thyroid. Yeah, and, the, and other doctors keep switching them back to Synthroid. Right. Well, Synthroid Synthetic, it was tested on men, and it's very effective in men because men somehow can convert their inactive thyroid into the active thyroid at the cellular level, but women often don't. So we don't have enough of the T3 that comes from T4 because we just can't convert it. So we need both T4 and T3. Synthroid is just T4. That's okay. it. So if you can't convert your T4 into T3, you're not going to make hair. If you don't have enough T3, you're not making hair. Okay. So you're not going to have a thick head of hair. You're going to have hair falling out. You're going to have brittle hair. And, and generally... The women who have this, and I give them back their thyroid, they're like, eh, now I'm getting hair on my arms and, you know, in the places they yeah. always had hair. Right. Um, and they don't like that, but but it's better to have hair on your head and have to deal with the other hair right. in, in the body. How does it do that? Or sleeves. How does it do that? Yeah. How does it make hair grow on your head, but um, not, not grow in other places? It has to do with the receptor site and how it responds to the thyroid. So... One more, uh, weight gain. People who come in and say part of their presenting problem is I'm bloated, I'm fat, I can't lose weight, and you put testosterone pellets in them, mm -hmm. and they come back and say I've added three pounds, I'm, I'm upset. Right. So that happens somewhat commonly. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's some but people there's that a, come back and they lost 30 pounds. I mean, but yeah. but there's, and that's more the exception than the rule, but it's most people stay the same, but there's always those people who gain. But, but it's more of an educational issue than a health issue, right? Right. It's more of an educational issue. So educate issue. us about that. So what happens when you get you begin taking testosterone is that you've lost muscle mass over time and replaced it with fat. So you're a lot bigger in volume because mm -hmm. one pound of muscle is small and one pound of fat is big. So, so basically you've gotten bigger, but your weight didn't climb that much. We give you testosterone and... You lose fat, you burn it up, and you gain muscle. So you have three kinds of weight contributors. You have water weight, mm -hmm. you have muscle weight, and fat weight. Right. And so whatever you weigh on any given day is a combination of those three factors, and they're yes. always sliding around depending on how much you're working out, mm -hmm. whether or not you have testosterone, what you and eat. how much fluids you're consuming. What you eat. What you eat. Well, I was trying to ignore that one. but <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. That's and that's true. The basically if you have no testosterone, you're not going to build a lot of muscle. Muscle burns calories. So our problem is usually in the very beginning when people come back for their first visit, they either stay the same, they didn't lose a dramatic amount of weight, or they gained a few pounds, but we use an in-body machine and Categorically, we show them that they have gained muscle mm -hmm. and lost fat, and they always admit that, yeah, they're, my, my belt's a little loose or my pants are falling off of me, so they're smaller. Yeah, I remember that, that as an effect for me. I mean, mm -hmm. I know today we're talking about women, but I remember coming back and saying I've lost a couple of inches. I'm, I've had changed pant sizes, mm -hmm. but I'm still weighing the same. Right, because you're, switch, you're trading muscle for fat. So, and it's much better to have a lot of muscle. Fat does nothing except insulate you and, and keep you from being cold but, and store toxins. That's about it. Well, and as luck would have it, you know, I was, that was consistent for me for a while that, that my body shape was changing, my weight was staying the same. And then you said, well, you, 
I happen to have a diet program and an exercise program. <laughs> we, yeah. We don't just put testosterone in you. Right. So, and generally, if you'd come in as a just a regular old patient, yeah, yeah, we would have given you your, and we did. We gave your, we yeah, gave but I Phyllis. Ignored I ignored it. <laughs> we gave Phyllis your diet, right? And we went through uh, an exercise program. So basically, we did give that to you. You ignored it. So then we go back and we patiently re- re- represent it to our patients. But in general, our patients don't gain weight. They in generally lose weight. But you have to get enough muscle to burn calories so that you can start really losing weight. Right. And so that first part is gaining enough muscle to do so. And also, most of my patients go, oh, I'm going to take testosterone and eat whatever I want. That it doesn't work. Well, Eating you, junk never works. You've complained for years that you have a number of women who come in who refuse to give up a glass of wine every afternoon or, or two or five. Or a or, big gulp soda. Yeah. I or, mean, yes. pure sugar. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And so, they, and they so want to... The, again, you're making those trade-offs. Weight, These are choices that you are making. And, and it's your, it's not my responsibility. I tell you what to do, but I can't go home with you. Right. So, you know, so my responsibility ends at... You should stop drinking wine while you're trying to get to your ideal weight. You should stop drinking big gulps forever because they're terrible for you. And you should put, you should drink something else. Get a buy, BAI, or get something, you know, that tastes good but doesn't have a lot of calories. And then the testosterone will help you lose weight. But it doesn't work just alone and so that you can do whatever you want to with your life. You still have to be healthy. So those are some of the more common concerns that women will experience around the topic of testosterone replacement with pellets. These are things that Dr. Maupin will be talking about in detail to the physicians uh, in in terms of how to educate their patients, in terms of how to manage their practices, uh, and and in terms of understanding what these complications are going to be and what they really mean in terms of is this relevant to the testosterone pellet or is this relevant to rule out some other issue. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that was helpful for you as well. And uh, thank you for listening. Thank you. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.